This morning we have a rather lengthy um, scripture reading. As I've told you, we are going through the book of Hebrews, not in the nuts and bolts. Uh, it just, it, it's interesting, you know, that um, as, as you go through any book, you find different um, pieces of what we would call systematic theology, as, as different pieces of the teaching of scripture as a whole. Uh, it's like a not like it, well, maybe not a good illustration, but it's kind of like a puzzle in the sense that all these pieces are sort of scattered throughout Scripture and you can gather them all together and you can look at particular doctrines and, and see them as they appear one by one through these verses. Or you can actually go through the book as uh, it was originally meant to be read, <laughs> which is as one whole message. Now, uh, we're actually doing a little bit of both. If we were doing just what this was originally intended to do, we would just simply read it from cover to cover and we would be finished with it. But we do need some explanation because we're not the original audience to whom these words were addressed. And we may not understand fully everything that's here. Plus, the Lord wants His ministers to take His Word and actually uh, apply it. And, of course, to apply... Uh, these things in the way that the author applies them. So I say that to say that we're, we're getting more of, of the main thrust of the, of the movement of this book rather than looking at every single doctrine that appears in it. And I believe the overall thrust of the book is that the readers would hold fast to Jesus Christ and not turn away from Him in order to save their lives. Again, you understand the context is that they're being tempted to do this because Rome is beginning to persecute the Christians. They're beginning to see that they're not Jews. Jews were the only religious group that were allowed to practice their religion because of the opposition they made to what Rome was enforcing on them. Well, the Christians didn't have to at this point, but now they're beginning to see with the Jews persecuting the Christians that the Christians aren't Jews, and so they're beginning to require this, and it's making the Jews, or excuse me, the Christians tempted to go back to Judaism to save their lives. The author to the Hebrews is showing them how much they need to love Jesus Christ, who it is they'd be giving up if they were to leave, uh, and what they'd have to face if they did, because He is the only way of salvation. So now we're going to see that Jesus is the one who brings the people of God into the rest of God. Moses couldn't do it, and that's who the Jews were trusting. Again, the Old Testament, Moses, the greatest prophet, and so forth. But he's pointing out there is one greater than Moses who actually brings his people into the true rest of God and not just a picture of that rest. And that's expounded in chapters 3 and 4. So I'd like to read 3 and 4 as we begin. Author to the Hebrews writes, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. He was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was in all his house. For he has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses by just so much as the builder of the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses was faithful in all his house as a servant, for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken later. But Christ was faithful as a son over his house, whose house we are if we hold fast our confidence and the boast of our hope firm until the end. Therefore, just as the Holy Spirit says today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts and they did not know my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brethren, that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. 
while it is said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt, led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Therefore, let us fear. If while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also. But the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter that rest just as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today, saying through David, after so long a time, just as has been said before, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. May the Lord again bless His Word to our hearing. Now again, because we are going through this looking at, as it were, the main thrust of the letter, we may not necessarily touch on every jot and tittle, and I may not necessarily have time to show you which verse I'm referencing, but I hope you'll, you'll see that as I'm, as I'm going through. So let's again remind ourselves of the thrust of the author to the Hebrews. He wants us to hold on to Jesus Christ, and in our context, not to leave Him for anything, not for the world or anything else. And the reasons we're looking at are the same reasons the author to the Hebrews gave to these Jewish Christians so that they wouldn't go back to Judaism to save their lives in this world and yet to lose their souls in the next now, we've seen so far that you shouldn't leave him because of who he is. He is your creator. He made you. He's the one who holds you up, the one who keeps you in existence. You realize that Jesus has your existence, not just your life, but your very existence in his hand. He is the one who guides you through life, the one who actually is in control of everything that happens to you. It's not by accident author to the Hebrews says, he is the sovereign Lord of history. He's also governing everything that goes on around you so that he makes sure that everything that happens in your life happens for your good. He is the one who sends his angels to minister to you. Remember, he is the king of the angels, and he's also the one who for a time became lower than the angels, who actually became a man to taste death for you so that you wouldn't have to die and so that you wouldn't have to be afraid of death. 
Why was the Apostle Paul able to say to depart and to be with Christ is very much better, knowing that he had to pass through death in order to get to him? It's because Jesus has taken the sting out of death. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, in doing all that He has done, in going through everything that He has gone through, has gone through everything you're going to have to face in this life, so that as you go through these things, He can help you. I tell you what, it's getting harder to find anyone today who really loves us, who really cares about us. Well, Jesus loves you if you're trusting Him this morning. And He loves you more than anyone else could possibly ever love you. So could you really ever leave Him for anyone else, for anything else, and especially this world that pretends to love you but actually wants to destroy your soul? And could you leave Him also knowing what would happen to you if you did? Because remember, Jesus is the only one who can save you from the consequences of your sins. He is the only one who has done what is necessary to free you from your sins. And if you don't hold on to Him, God will judge you, even as He judged those who didn't listen to His prophets, even as He judged those that would not listen to His angels, they're the ones who delivered the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, only more so because in these last days, which actually of course, began back in their days, the days in which these were written, He has spoken to us through His Son. You have to hold on to Jesus. If you don't, your sins will destroy you. But if you do, He will save you and He will bring you into heaven. Now, the author to the Hebrews is going to answer the question this morning, how can we know or how do we know that Jesus is able to bring us to heaven? Well, the answer is because He Himself has entered into heaven, and in doing so, He has provided a door for you to go through if you will trust Him and continue to trust Him throughout your life. Now, the author goes on to show us and to show, again, remember that uh, his focus is his readers, Jewish Christians who are very familiar with Jewish history, very familiar with the Old Covenant. He is contrasting what Jesus has done with those who are the greatest of the Old Testament, in this case, the Old Testament mediators, to show that Jesus is so much better. And even though it may not resonate with us as much as it would with the Jews, there are still things here that are very applicable to us because Jesus is still the only one who can bring us into the rest of God. Moses could not do that, but Jesus did. So what I want us to do is consider three things this morning. First of all, that Moses was not able to bring God's people into his rest. Secondly, what Moses couldn't do, the one who was greater than Moses actually did. And then third, we do need to get the the exhortation, the focus that is here from the author to the Hebrews as far as what it is that you and I need to do if we are actually to enter into that rest that Jesus entered into, if we are to enter into heaven. So first of all, let's consider that as great as Moses was, he wasn't able to bring God's people into his rest. Now, the first thing I want to do is exonerate Moses. Let's let's make sure that we understand that it wasn't his fault. Moses was actually a faithful servant in God's house. It wasn't his fault the people weren't able to go into God's rest. It was the people's fault. Now, the author to the Hebrews is going to show us a little bit later that the problem was not with the old covenant, just as it wasn't with Moses. The problem wasn't with the covenant. The problem was with the people. The people just did not want to do what God wanted them to do. They didn't want to keep His commandments. They didn't want to trust Him. And so finally the Lord says, I don't care for you anymore. These are people who always err in their hearts, and He swore in His wrath they would not enter into His rest. Now, why did that happen? Well, it happened, as the author again is going to show us later, because the law that was written on stone tablets was not able to change the hearts of His people. 
to make them love Him and to make them willing to do what He wanted them to do. Stone tablets with a law on it cannot give you the power to obey. Of course, we're going to see God's remedy for that as well. He takes those laws by His Spirit in the New Covenant and He writes them on the heart. Well, that was the problem. The, the law could not change the hearts of God's people, and that's why they would not obey Him. But we do need to understand that Moses was transformed by the grace of God. There were people who were saved in the Old Covenant through the power of the New Covenant, through the power of Jesus Christ, who looked ahead and actually trusted in the Messiah who was coming. Well, Moses was one of those people. And Moses did what God called him to do. Moses was faithful by his grace. He obeyed God. He went down into Egypt. He led the people out, not without a great deal of difficulty, by the way. And he brought them to the border of the promised land. And then he sent the 12 spies into the land, as God told him to do, one from each of the tribes to spy out the land and to come back with a report and so forth. But when the spies returned, you know there was a split decision, as it were. There were 10 spies who said, you know what, the, the, the cities have walls that go up to heaven. There's giants in the land. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. There's no way we're going to be able to take this land. And the other two spoke up and said, you know what, these, these things are nothing to God. Let's by all means go up. God's going to give us the land in the way that He said. Well, the people listen to the ten spies, and they refuse to listen to the two who knew that their God was able to give them the land and were fully convinced. They hardened their hearts against God. And so God vowed in His wrath they would never enter into His rest. Now, at this particular juncture, it's talking about the land of Palestine. And even that land was purely of God's grace. It was a, a land that was blessed by God. It was a land they did not deserve. God did not give them that land. He did not give them what they didn't deserve. He didn't give them grace. Rather, God gave them what they did deserve. And this is the thing we have to make sure we understand. When God pours out wrath and judgment he is only giving them what they deserve. They decide they're not going to take grace. We don't want grace, God. Give us what we deserve instead. Well, that's what God gives them, and it is what they have earned. God sentenced them to wander for 40 years in the wilderness until that whole generation of Jews that would not trust Him died. Now, Moses failed to bring them in but only because the people that he led to the boundary of the promised land did not have faith. They did not trust God, and so they all died in the wilderness. Well, the author to the Hebrews, of course, wants to emphasize the good news, which is what Moses failed to do, one who was greater than Moses, Jesus, actually did. He succeeded in bringing the people into God's rest. Now, we do need to understand, I think, what the author to the Hebrews is referring to here by rest because he's using it in different term, or different ways, isn't he? In one instance, it's referring to the land of Palestine, but the rest that he's encouraging his people to enter into is not the land of Palestine. It's not the land of promise. That was only a picture of the true rest of God, a picture of heaven. As a matter of fact, a lot of the words that were used to describe the promised land are words that the Lord used to describe heaven in, in the symbolic terms to show us what a tremendous blessing it really is. The land of Palestine was really a picture of the rest that God enjoyed at the end of the creation week. That was not the true rest of God. Moses wasn't even able to bring them into the picture of the rest. But Jesus brings us into the true rest. Now, how do we know that the land of Palestine is not the true rest of God that's being referred to here? Well, because the author to the Hebrews actually showed us in here that many years after Joshua actually brought the people into the land of Palestine, that David was still exhorting God's people to enter into God's rest, 
Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. And really, his whole sermon here, this whole point he's making in these two chapters is based on that word today. If, if those who had entered into the promised land under Joshua were already enjoying God's rest, then why would David be exhorting them to enter into the rest? They're already there. Well, the true rest is heaven. That's the whole point. It's the same rest that God enjoyed at the end of the creation week, the same rest that Jesus entered into when His work was finished. Now, there is another reason why Jesus' work was better than Moses, because what Moses did was merely a shadow. It was merely a type or a picture of what Jesus was going to do. Jesus is the one who actually brings the reality. He is the one, and He's always been the only one who can actually bring us all the way to heaven, who can actually bring us into that rest. Now, again, going back to the beginning, why can't we enter into that rest by ourselves? It's because when Adam sinned, he not only cut himself off of heaven, but he cut all of us off as well. The Bible says in a certain sense, when Adam sinned, he actually destroyed the entire creation. It all fell under sin, under the curse. Jeremiah 4.23, the earth is again pictured as formless and void which is the condition, as it were, the Spirit of God found it in when He was working during the creative week to bring shape and to bring order to it. Adam sinned and he brought the creation under the curse, and by the way, he brought you under that curse as well. But when Jesus came into the world, His work redeemed the creation. Really, not just us, but, but the whole creation. And that is the reason why there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth when Jesus finally returns. That's why when you trust in Jesus Christ, the Bible says you become a new creature because you become a part of the new creation. What the first Adam destroyed, the second Adam restores. And when Jesus Christ was finished with that work, after He had died on the cross, He rose again on the third day, and He entered into His rest. He entered into heaven itself, really to finish the work or complete the work of bringing you to heaven through His mediation. The Bible tells us that our Lord Jesus Christ is praying in heaven for you if you are trusting Him this morning. Now, that's why heaven still exists after the fall. That's why there is a place still where all the redeemed will one day be gathered together. I mean, there are those that are there already. The author to the Hebrews is going to remind us. And we have loved ones who are there right now immersed in God's perfect love and worshiping before the throne. It's because of the work of Jesus Christ. That's why the possibility of still entering that rest remains as David and the author to the Hebrews is telling us. And, by the way, that's the reason why there is still a Sabbath day. <clears throat> if there was no rest for you to enter into into the future, there really wouldn't be a need for a picture that points forward to that rest, that picture that we enjoy every single Lord's Day. <clears throat> when we rest from our work and separate ourselves from this world and gather together to worship the Lord who redeemed us. This day is a picture of that rest. Now, the author to the Hebrews says that you can still enter into God's rest. You can still go to heaven. The door is still open because of what Jesus Christ did. But the last thing we need to consider, of course, is what do you have to do? What does the author say you have to do finally to enter into that rest? It's not a, an automatic slam dunk, as it were. What Jesus did is not going to be applied to everyone. There are going to be those who suffer forever in hell, who don't enter into rest but have no rest day and night forever and ever because they are in torment. That place is real. And there are people who are there now. And God forbid there may be people among us that are actually going to be spending eternity there. What do you have to do to enter into heaven, into God's rest? 
Well, first of all, you do have to trust Jesus to bring you in there because there's no other way. God will not accept you the way that you are. There is nothing that you can do to make Him accept you. There's no work you can perform because everything you do in God's eyes falls short and you've already fallen short your whole life. You fell short when you came into the world, being a child of Adam. Jesus is the only one who is able to bring you into that rest because He was the only one who was able to enter it Himself. And the only way that He brings anyone in is through faith in Him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Now, if you haven't looked to Jesus Christ, that's where you need to begin. You need to look to Him to forgive your sins. You need to turn from your sins and trust in Him. That is the starting point. But now the author to the Hebrews is taking into account that these people have already professed faith in Jesus Christ. So now he's addressing those of us who believe ourselves to be Christians, what do you need to do to enter into heaven? Well, realize that trusting in Jesus is just the starting point. That's when the battle actually begins. By the way, that's what the book Heaven Taken by Storm is all about. There are things that you still need to do in order to arrive in heaven. And I should say at the outset, the Lord is going to give you the grace to do this if you have trusted in Him. What does the author to the Hebrews say you have to do? What is the Spirit of God saying to you through the author? You must hold fast your confidence and the boast of your hope firm until the end. This is the thrust of the author's letter or his sermon to the Hebrews. You have to hold on to Jesus Christ. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is not a one-time act where you pray a prayer and say, there, I'm saved. Now I can live any way I want to. I can do whatever I want to. God's going to forgive me. He's going to bring me to heaven. No, you need to hold fast to Him. You need to trust Him every single day. You need to rely on Him for your only hope of heaven, and you must never let go of Him for anything, not for fame, not for fortune, not for anything in this world, not for anyone in this world, not even to save your life. You have to hold on to Him even unto death. Jesus says, if you're not willing to die... For me, don't bother to come after me. You have to be willing to give up your life. And that means not just if somebody threatens your life for being a Christian, you have to be willing to die at that point. You need to be willing to die every day. Die to yourself. Pick up your cross and follow Him. To enter into heaven, the author to the Hebrews says, you have to guard your heart and keep it from becoming hard to the things of the Lord. These Jews that Moses led out of Egypt to the boundary of the promised land already had their issues. But the final straw was when they refused to listen to those two men who were telling them the truth, the truth about God, the truth about the land, the truth about what these people were in the sight of God, which was nothing. They refused to listen to the truth. They hardened their hearts. They would not trust God. And so God said they would not enter into His rest. You need to guard your heart from becoming hard. By the way, He also says you need encouragement. You need the encouragement of your brothers and sisters in the Lord. That encouragement that can only come about when you meet together for worship. When we worship, we're still fellowshipping. We're still encouraging one another by our faith as we watch one another as we hear one another and we see each other's affections, that should stir our affections and encourage us. When we spend time together following in Christian fellowship, if we focus on building one another up, that can have that same kind of effect. You see, you're not going to get this from the world. The world is only going to pour water on the fire of your affection, on the fire of your love for God. That's all the world can do. But worship and fellowship will add the kind of fuel to the fire that that fire needs to make it burn stronger. You need fellowship. You need to be pushing towards heaven, the author to the Hebrews says, and not to fall away by following this example of those who came out of Egypt led by Moses. We need to make sure that we are not those who when faced with a decision between right and wrong, that we say, well, I'll just choose the wrong because I know God is gracious. 
or when I can choose between things that will either increase my love for Him or pour water on it, that I keep choosing the wrong thing. We need to make sure we're pushing towards heaven. Now, again, I've already reminded you, the Lord does not leave you to do all of this on your own. The Lord will help you. He gives you several things to help you. The means of grace. He talks about this actually in chapter 4, verses 12, where he talks about the Word of God is able to discern what's going on in your heart. God gave you His Word to reveal His love for you. I mean, that's what He's doing here when He's talking about all that Jesus Christ has done. He wants to stir up your affections for who this one is. He shows you not only that He loves you, but all that He's done for you, and He also shows you your own heart through the Word of God and how to overcome the sin that is in your heart. But you need to read the Bible. You need to read it every single day. You need to read it in faith. You need to believe it. What it says is true. But again, don't just knock off your chapter, one chapter, two chapter, got a little bit of head knowledge and I'm all set. No, the Lord wants you to allow that word to work in your heart, to stir your heart for Him so that you will be more inclined to hold on for Him or hold on to Him and press forward into the kingdom of heaven. Again, as Thomas Watson says, love heaven and you cannot miss it because love breaks through all opposition. It takes heaven by storm. And the more you love Him, the more you will move forward to heaven. Another encouragement the author to the Hebrews gives us is the fact that God sees you. Everything about you is laid open to Him. So don't try to fool Him. Be honest with Him. And be honest with yourself and let His Word search your heart and show you what's inside it. And then finally, let's not forget the, perhaps the greatest of these encouragements, and that is when you need help. And we need help every day, don't we? There is one who is standing ready to help you. You have a great high priest who not only laid down his life to save your life, but one who has gone through the things that you were going through and one who is disposed to be merciful. He is a merciful high priest and he is willing and able to give you grace to meet your needs and to help you enter into his rest. You have a great high priest who has made every provision for your soul to get you into heaven. But you need to trust Him. You need to look to Him. You need to love Him. You need to follow Him. You need to turn from your sins and from this world. You need to hold on to Him all the way to the end. If you do, and He'll give you the grace to do that, if you trust Him, if you do, He will bring you into His rest. May the Lord give us the grace to receive these encouragements because remember, this book was not written just to that audience. These words were preserved for us as well and every generation of Christians. These things are addressed to you and the Lord wants you to receive them. He wants you to hold on to Him all the way to the end. May God give us the grace to do that. Let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask Him to help us.